We'd like to scale. We're very confident as a, as a team, company, that we're on the right track. They have extensive experience. They've acquired over 8,500 acres. Yeah, I think there's a lot of investors that understand fix and flips, wholesaling, or that understand rentals. But with the notes, it's I say that there's a, an easier an easier way to do it. Initially, we're focusing on single family homes and transition to land notes in 2016. Right now, if there was a bottleneck in our business, it would be finding the right investors for these notes. Hi there, welcome to The Fundication Show. I'm Julie Tallman, and I'm with the host, Christian Sadler. Hey everybody. And today we have Rick and Crystal Rumor from Texas Secured Notes. The Texas Secured Notes team has, been, has spent the last decade mastering the art of note origination. They have extensive experience. They've acquired over 8,500 acres. They've managed numerous construction projects and originated hundreds of notes. And they initially were focusing on single family homes and transition to land notes in 2016. So we're gonna hear all about that. We're gonna hear about what Rick and Crystal do, their, their roles that they play for Texas Secured Notes. But just to give you a little bit of background, Rick, you started your real estate investment journey at night, whopping age of 19. Yeah. I think that was your first rental property, right? Yes, it was. When 2008 rolled around, kind of during the financial crisis, he worked as a financial advisor for J.P. Morgan, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, before making a full-time transition into real estate in 2010. And Rick and Crystal, your ventures have expanded from wholesaling and flips to owner financing and note origination, and beyond. Beyond real estate, they're really passionate and involved in humanitarian and a nonprofit, which I love and love to give the human aspect props here. Um, they work with providing mentoring and refuge to individuals who have escaped from sex trafficking. So we're, this, this has nothing to do with notes, but we're going to have to ask you about it as right. that's big congratulatory act. Oh, so thank you for thank you for being here and spending time with us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. This is exciting to to be here, see Christian again, and uh, meet you as well. Meet you in person, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. We love Utah. Besides the dryness, welcome to Utah. <laughs> absolutely. And so let's start with, can you tell us about your roles within Texas Secured Notes? I know you've got a team that you work with. What do you guys individually do? Uh, so what we focus on is business development and investor relations. And so it's not just Rick and Crystal, we've got a full team on the front end and then on the back end as well. And so we've got a full acquisition team. Mm -hmm. Rick, you can kind of explain more on what that looks like with originating our notes. And then we focus on selling the notes that we've originated. Okay. And we're also going to talk to you too about how we now have some of your listings on our pre i share listing hub which is really exciting yeah. and i want to ask christian how that came about because i never never heard the story so with that help us understand the full operation of texas secured notes and how you guys got involved with it so obviously we have uh, a lot of experience and we've done a little bit of real estate here and there there's probably a zillion people out there that have done similar things to what we've done one of our passions was was creating the notes. Uh, it seemed to be just kind of the, the the avenue within real estate that we really that we we really stuck to, um, that really captivated us. So um, just like you mentioned, we we had been doing some um, nonprofit work up in Alaska, but as we came back, we gave a couple of calls to some real estate investors that we knew, and. Um, we found somebody that was pursuing uh, those those notes that was originating those notes, and so we were just like, "Oh, that's." We already had extensive work with him. We just knew that that was going to be a good fit, and so that's where where we jumped in. Yeah, we our first uh, note that we actually originated was a fix and flip that we couldn't sell, and so we were going, "What are we going to do now?" And so. We ended up calling the uh, another investor that we were partnered in on that deal, and we said, okay, I think this is the avenue that we're gonna try. So we ended up originating a note there. Well, then we ended up having some rentals that went bad. Of all times, Houston, Texas ended up freezing. It never freezes. Mm. And we had a renter that skipped out, and pipes froze and busted. And um, 
we were going, okay, what are we going to do now? We're sick and tired of these rentals. There's got to be an easier way. So then we started originating the notes that way. And it wasn't until 2016 when our friend Mark started getting on the land side. So we had always done uh, notes on the residential side. And we had a little bit of um, experience on land development. We had started and built an oil field housing facility. That was years ago as well. But so we knew a little bit on the development side, but our the other investor had had already been doing the land notes. And basically our model and what we do is we buy large parcels of land, we subdivide them. So we may buy anywhere from what, 100 acres to 400 acres. Mm -hmm. And then we subdivide them into smaller tracks. And so they can be anywhere from three to five acre tracks, um, 10, 12 acre tracks. And then we owner finance them to borrowers. And with our whole team, which is great, we don't just borrow to anyone, but we have a full vetting process that we do. You may want to explain more on that, but we have a whole team that goes through this vetting process with the borrower to make sure that they have the ability to pay. And then as we originate that note, you know, i.e. mortgage, then we turn around and sell that note to investors as ourselves that are looking for an above average return and we're securing them 10 15 20 years okay. as well rick do you want to tell us a little bit about some of those vetting steps like what do you normally look for so uh, one of the most important things we utilize is an rmlo um, residential mortgage loan loan originator so they're going to come in and they're going to look at the borrower. They're going to look at their credit scores. They're going to look at their debt to income. Obviously, they're going to pull their financials, bank accounts, etc. So obviously, that's one of the main ways that we keep our default rate so low is we utilize this RMLO to say, yes, this person can enter into this contract and they have the full means to be able to pay that. Um, it, they also keep us legal on a, you know, so that we're not taking advantage of anybody or, you know, getting into loans that we shouldn't be getting into. But the RMLO process is probably the, the biggest thing that we do on the front end to make sure that, once again, that's a good borrower for us. And then why land? I know you said you transitioned and, and that's what you're doing, but why? Look, there's a, there's a lot of people out there originating single family notes. Nothing wrong with that. Um, I have people that come up to us and say, well, I don't understand land. And I was like, well, you've already done it. You just did land with with a house on it. You know, you already did it. It's just a little bit more complicated. We're actually going to simplify it a little bit. Let's just clean the slate and let's just start with a piece of land and we'll owner finance that. Um, as far as when people say why land versus or land versus um, single family residences, what they're thinking about is the collateral. You know, and the collateral only comes into play once again, two to four percent of the time historically, if you ever, you know, have to foreclose on it. And that's when you want that value to really be there. Um, and so when you think about it that way, people feel more comfortable with a single family home. But I say there's more things that can go wrong with a single family home. Uh, I think we've all known of uh the little old lady that had 15 cats that ruined all the carpet and things of that nature or you can easily have a twenty thousand dollar kitchen that gets ruined by somebody that's that's in there and they devalue the property mm -hmm. i'm not saying you can't devalue land property but for the most part you know it's, yeah, it's kind of difficult to do and, and so and when we sell these we're selling them to people that want to um, make that a single family residence in the future and so, yes, it may be a blank piece of land that has power and road frontage, but among the first things they're going to do is they're going to make improvements to it. So that makes us feel better on our position because, once again, they're making improvements. They're raising the value of the property. On a single family home, how often do buyers add square footage to their house? Not that often. They're you know, everybody wants the appreciation. Well, land appreciates just like houses appreciate. 
there's just less to go wrong. I mean, the land is always worth more than the mm -hmm. actual structure itself, right? Mm -hmm. And so typically if you're coming in and you're only basing off the land value, like you said, I think you de-risk that in a lot of ways because most people that are coming into a blank piece of land are going to make improvements, as, mm -hmm. as you just mentioned. Right. Whereas oftentimes uh, a house is deteriorating over time. And mm -hmm. if they do get to the point where they're going to change that structure, where they're going to modify that structure, they're probably refinancing out that loan to do so because they need to borrow against to do major improvements like that because they're usually starting from a higher basis point. Yeah. At least this is my perspective. I'm pretty passionate about, you know, um, notes and, and different things. In fact, the part of the reason this even came about and when we connected so well mm -hmm. at the event is, you know, I analyzed, um, you know, if I wasn't, you know, stepping into a leadership role with pre iShare and everything here, what would I want to be doing? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I every once in a while we have to, you know, reevaluate where we're going to focus in the real estate sector, even if we've been real estate investors like me for my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. And really, I, if I look backwards at um, the people who always made money, when I was fixing and flipping properties, when I had bought land, when I had done different things, whether I won on those deals, whether I lost on those deals, whether I came out even on those deals, the first position lien note holder always won. They always got their expected return and usually more mm -hmm. because if I took any longer for one reason or another, or if I had issues for one reason or another, I was usually paying some sort of points or penalties right. in order to keep the note good. And so I think that adds to the conversation. Yeah, I, I think um, one thing we deal with in the note world is it's just not sexy. You know, it's just not... <laughs> We're doing our best. Okay. You know what I do like about it from somebody like me that just has just enough OCD. If I have a rental home, I can't drive by and see what's happening in my, in the twenty thousand dollar kitchen. Mm -hmm. I can't drive by and see the plot of land and go, okay, everything is still a plot of land. <laughs> like there is a certain amount of control and yeah. rest that you can feel from having that, those type of notes. So I understand that mm -hmm. that solidified. It um, lack of complexity well and in conversations you guys have actually shared that right sometimes when you'll sell a note one of the things that you do for those people who buy the note is you'll do flybys with a drone or something of Absolutely. that sort and say here's where it's at in process now by the way they've added a structure or mm -hmm. you know they've added a fence around the property and mm -hmm. every time something like that happens it's an increase in the value uh, even though that doesn't necessarily increase your note amount you just Correct. know that your collateral is gaining right. um, essentially it's being de-risked. Right. Yeah. Right. And after COVID, we saw such a mass exodus uh, get out of the city. So many people yeah. are wanting their own little slice of heaven outside of the city. But all of our properties are going to be located 20 to 45 minutes from a larger city where they still have the option of the conveniences, but they still have their slice of land. It's so funny you say that because I've always been like a prepper at heart. I love having my food storage <laughs> and security is big. But right after COVID, my husband and I bought an RV and it was like, I just want a little plot of land, maybe a well or something. I think we all dream about yeah, that. So right. that is so real, have it, that security. It really is. And a lot of people are wanting to have their own animals, have their own food, um, build their own place. And so there's not a shortage. So we're all over Texas and in Arkansas, south of Little Rock in Arkansas, but we have not found a shortage in borrowers. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, and I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. So either. I heard you talk about how you'll divvy up some of the lead. Is that a partial? I've heard about part, what is a partial? It's a good question uh, because it, it's an ambiguous term when we're talking about notes. It's not very explanatory. It, it's not. Um, so partials, there's a few different ways you can do partials. Um, we'll split up the land and create individual notes. So that would, whether it be a $100,000 note or a $300,000 note, one borrower, one investor, or one, one person banking that note, if you will, the lender on it, uh, that would just be a single note. Uh, but there's a couple of different ways you can do partials. You can do partial principal, you can do partial term, and you can also do partial rate. Some people actually split up the rates um, or split up the term. 
Uh, there's a lot of investors out there that will buy a note. Uh, let's say they want to buy the first 96 months of a 15-year note, and they will offer and they will buy just the front end months okay. of payments and not the back end. Um, and then it would revert back to the original owner. Uh, what we do, we focus on partials, what we'd call a partial a print, partial principal note. Uh, and that is, you know, if, if here's a note, it's $100,000, but you don't quite have enough to do that, then if you want, we can sell you 50% of that note and you would get 50% of the payment. You put in 50% of the principal, you get 50% of the, the, the payment. You, it's still at the same interest rate. It's still at the same term. None of that changes with the borrower. You retain first lien position. We can actually split that first lien position that you would share equitably, depending on if there were three of you that went in together, together or if there were four of you that went in together on that particular note. How in the world do you track all of this? <laughs> Tell me there's a software for it. Phenomenal team. Yeah, Terry, Perla, Ashley, okay. like just back in that they are, I, I think we have the best team. I know everyone says that, but that handles our paperwork. I would say that's a big, um, what we get back, I guess, feedback a lot of times is like, man, your paperwork is so clean because they're crossing T's, dotting I's and tracking everything. That's so great. Yeah. Well, and this is where you, you know, when you think about the big picture of it, you know, the, the biggest buildings, as you, you know, call it that are out there are owned by the banks. And what are they doing? They're issuing notes, right? Mm -hmm. And they're right. getting very creative in how they do that. And this is why if you go finance a home, sometimes the very next week, you're going to get the letter that says this has been transferred because essentially somebody's issuing the note, somebody's yeah. buying the, you know, the secondaries of that note. And, and there's all kinds of different things that can happen, you know, without that, I, I don't think you guys are getting, you know, as creative as packaging these things up right. into mortgage backed securities or anything of that sort. Of course, if you start a fund, you're almost kind of going down that route, depending on how you structure it. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of creative creativity that can happen with notes. Bare bones basics, though, with what you guys are doing is you're 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 creating the note because you already have a spread based mm -hmm. on what you bought the land for and what what you're selling it for That's individually right. packaged, right? You buy a, a box of Pepsi and then you sell it off by the can right. type of a deal. Um, so you already have a spread there, and then you're making additional spread because you're getting an interest rate rather than um, selling it outright and, and forcing them to Absolutely. come up with their own financing, which therefore you also have a higher uh, buyer pool because many people can visualize themselves saying, I could put down X amount of dollars and make this monthly payment, but many of them can't th think through all of the processes of how do I go get that money to buy it? outright whether that's through a bank or otherwise and i think that's a that's a valid point that there's in this current economic environment there's a lot of people um it depends on uh which media outlet you want to subscribe to but some people say that 50 percent of the country is not bankable right now um so once again just like crystal said earlier we're not having a shortage of uh, of borrowers, of people that are looking to to get this piece of land and need somebody to to lend for them, and they have uh, jobs or businesses. They're entrepreneurs themselves, or have a job where they're they're paying, they're um, putting a larger amount down, or they do have a good debt to income or credit score. I mean, it may not always be perfect for all of them, but we have uh, a lot of borrowers that have great credit score i was looking at one the other day it was over 800 kind of i was like why whoa okay uh -huh. we'll take you yeah. so what are what are those demographics and what are some of your minimums or maximums if you will so is there a minimum credit score is there a maximum debt to income ratio can you share some of that um, I don't know that there is a, a minimum credit score uh, per se. Uh, it obviously, there's so many aspects. It's, well, how much do you want to put down? Um, you know, what is your debt to income? We do look at a, a ceiling of debt to income um, around 44%. Anytime you, you get over 40%, you got to, you know, certainly check things, uh, check things out. 
but we rely, like I said, heavily on the RMLO. I hate to come back to that, but they do a lot of that work for us and say, yeah, this is a good borrower or mm, probably not a good borrower for you. Yeah, checking references, how much is in the bank. For instance, we had one that had uh, well over 150000 just sitting in the bank. Um, and so, but only, a you know, five something credit score or six something credit score, but you know, they only put down 10%, but at the same time, they've got more in the bank than we're actually financing them for. So you've got to, you've got to wait just like you do due diligence on any other real estate transaction. Part of the due diligence is looking at the borrower. Yeah. So there's ins and outs and you learn, you learn that a little bit, um, but yeah, you want to do your due diligence on the borrower just like you would on, on any other transaction. So essentially your tolerance tolerances are going to be weighted. So right, you'll you'll move your tolerances if they have, you know, a stronger aspect over here, then then you'll allow this one to be a little less weighted on the other side. But you're essentially looking at the big picture and is this somebody that we feel confident right. is going to follow through? Absolutely. And we're confident too, as a, as a company that we want to keep our investors happy as well. And so if worst case scenario, our um, default rate is low, but if that was to happen, we've all had to deal with, with those. We do like Texas, Arkansas, because they are lender friendly states. Um, and so if we had that happen, we help our investors with reloading, getting another note. So they're not missing those payments and they're continuing to get their cash flow because ultimately with notes, it's all about the cash flow and securing that income, that monthly income. What kind of cash flow can somebody expect? A uh, $100,000 note, uh, 10 year, uh, let's say 15 year term, 10% interest rate just to make all those numbers nice and round. Yeah. I want to say uh, that's a little bit over $1,000 a month in, in passive income. On a 15-year note at 10%, $100,000 uh, loaned out on that, you can make a little bit over $1,000 a month. Um, and I've had a couple of um, potential um, investors come to me and say, Rick, well, I don't want to I'm only get so I'm going to get $1,000 a month? And you're like, yeah, you're going to get $1,000 a month, but I have to give you $100,000. Well, I mean, you're going to purchase the note. Yes. He goes, well, how long is it going to take before I break even? And I said, wrong question. That That's not a good question. When you put $100,000 in the stock market, you still you don't have $100,000 in your pocket, but you're still going to make a return. The same thing on these notes. You buy a, a note for $100,000 that has those same numbers I just mentioned. And uh, let's say two years goes by. You've now pocketed $24,000 in monthly income. But what is the note worth? Right. The note is still worth, uh, if my calculations are correct, somewhere around $96,000. It's not $100,000 minus 24, because remember, we, we've all looked at amortization schedules and just had our eyeballs or pop out and smoke come out of our ears because we're paying all of this interest. Mm -hmm. The same thing applies on a note. Uh, you're just the bank, yep. so you're receiving it. So what that means is those first few years, they're paying mainly interest and that, uh, that principal is going down very little. So when people say, well, how long is it going to be until I break even? I say month one, because you're going to make $1,000 on your, on your $100,000. And if you ever want to go sell that note, it still has you know, that 99.9% .9 of the value because you know they paid so much the interest and very little really principal change for a yeah. very long yeah. time. You'd it, rather have the interest on the the first five years than the last five years. Yeah. You know, so if you're gonna own a note, it's advantageous to to own it up front as opposed to the rear because of what I just said. It's gonna the value is gonna decrease quicker that last five years. Does and this make, is what the banks sense? know. Right. Yeah. So this is why banks are sending, you know, sending it out there and saying, we're going to finance you at 4%, 5%, 6%. I think right now currently 8%, but you know, the, the number still stands, whatever that number is. But then if you look at your payment, 
if 90% of your payment is going towards interest, that's not 8%, right? That's right. But it's because of that front-loaded interest. Yeah. And I mean, the big banks understand they have their actuaries that are running numbers constantly on human behavior, and they know every five to seven years that that person is going to refinance, they're going to sell the property, um, whatever it is, and they're gonna start that clock over. And so essentially, if you can get those uh, types that are going to improve the property, and then they're gonna wanna reap the reward of that equity that they've built, typically, you're gonna get paid off and you can reissue a new note and get that front-loaded interest. Right. I think that's important to cover and, and talk about because once again, uh, the average term of our notes, 15 years. Well, People say, well, what if I want to, what if I want to do another investment in five years or ten years? Most likely, that is not going to get carried out through the term. If it does, you're going to make money hand over fist. If it's a ten percent on the, uh, if it's ten percent, you're going to make ten percent on your money every year, and you're going to be very happy with that. But what are the outcomes? How how do you get out of these, or, or what happens to this note? Is exactly what you just said. They move. They, they sell the property. They refinance the property. They come into some of their money themselves and they pay off the rest. All of these are very good scenarios for you. At first, I used to get frustrated when somebody would pay you off early because they give you your money back and you're like, well, it, it, the, the money stream just stopped. But you still made your 10% in that last example. You still made 10% on your money over that term and you enjoyed that for, for while you had it. Well, how long have you guys been issuing notes? And do you know what that number is by chance of how, uh, what the average time frame before somebody refinances on land versus like a single family home? I would say it's, it's the same thing. Uh, what we're seeing is that five to seven year range, if I had to guess, um, kind of the same average that you see in single family homes before that goes about. Now, what, what we were, you, you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, there's so many different, uh, I, f I forget how you, how you put it. Um, but people are looking to diversify, I guess notes are, uh, have been a, a topic lately and have been building lately because there's people that are invested in all types of properties. And with this current economic environment, it's like, you know, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen to the value of this property, but I can get into a note that's once again, locked into a 15 year term and 10% on my money. So it's, this is a good environment right now to look at the long term locking in of, of, of your funds and, and getting that interest rate. Are we going to see it for 15 years? Maybe somebody will refinance before then. If they don't, you know, all the better. Yeah. And we always talk about, I mean, for me, I, I, I use the saying that real estate is the most forgiving asset class out there. Mm -hmm. Cause if you can hold it long enough, ultimately, you know, the value is going to catch up or exceed Absolutely. whatever mistakes maybe you've made along the way. But the biggest fear in real estate is you never lose it all unless the bank takes it back. Mm -hmm. right. Because you always have, you know, for the typically anyways, you're going to have insurance, you're going to have things that can cover you if a deal goes really bad, as long as you've got, you know, at least the finance, you know, financial capabilities to hold on to the property. Mm -hmm. But the banks are always in the lowest risk position. Even though they're putting out the most amount of money, the reason that they are is because they have the lowest risk. Because ultimately, if something goes wrong, they take the property back and they can resell it at a higher price. That's right. And they can essentially either get their money back plus some, or they can reissue another note to somebody else. Absolutely. And I had shared that uh, situation with you guys where someone had bought a couple of years ago a property from us a borrower did well then he ended up having to move well he sold his property and the value of that property of his track that he bought went up it was he bought it around two hundred thousand went up to over uh, over two hundred thousand more than what he paid for and so uh we worst case scenario if we had to take back that land well value continues to just go up and up. And so when you ask why land, we just laugh and be like, why not? There's so many added values. So that percentage, that small percentage, the default is hugely compensated by the appreciation. That's right. So, yeah. so you were just you were just hitting on the banks. I like to say the banks are in the biggest power position in real estate because 
they're truly passive and and because if anything ever goes wrong you know they they get to go and take that back they have the ultimate control yeah. um and so that's a that's a good feeling and there's a there's a reason why we're focusing um, in the markets that we are, it's because we feel like that those are very strong markets. There are other markets around the country that, you know, we might not be as interested in, in creating notes in. Um, but, but so far for us, uh, Texas and Arkansas has been a great fit for us. I would imagine, uh, Utah here would be a fantastic, uh, place as well. And there's, there's other places around the country that would be a good fit. I mean, I definitely know of a family here locally in Utah, and they have bought tens of thousands of acres in, you know, rural areas, mm -hmm. and they just constantly, I mean, for as long as I've been in real estate, almost 20 years now, they've been issuing these properties where you can put as little as $500 down, and you can get into a property and make the payments over time, and so that is their business model, mm -hmm. and so... I'm curious because, you know, I don't know where their their money came from, but I'm I, I always think about the business behind the business, right? right? We're talking about buying individual notes, which, you know, many investors can can come up with the idea for that. Maybe they're going to pull money out of a a home equity line of credit to buy it. Maybe they have some cash from another investment. Maybe they're going to use their retirement account to go buy this note. But what about? on your business, how did you get into buying in these large plots of land and then splitting them up? Because it's difficult to issue a first position lien note to somebody if you didn't, uh, or if you, yeah, if you uh, borrowed the money to get mm -hmm. started. So did you come in, is this something where the partnership is, is got involved and that's how you guys had the cash up front? Or was there a different financial structure behind it? Yeah, I would say definitely there's uh, th these, each project or each uh, large tract of land in general has been with a with a JV, and you've gone in. And yes, we're we're looking at private funds to go in and, and partner on these to get that done, because um, it does take some capital. And and we've we've also utilized some some hard money loans, you know, in order to get in and do that. Um, just like you said earlier, uh, we make our spread on on the front end, and so we feel. Uh, very confident in, in our ability to go in and get that land and get it at the appropriate price so that we can get out of it. And, uh, you know, we're, we're holding a lot in notes right now and um, we're not necessarily in the, in the feeling that we've got to liquidate them to get rid of them because of all of the benefits that we just mentioned. Just to have that passive income is not a bad thing. Um, but, but yes, to answer your question directly, uh, private funds for the most part to get into those. Got it. So typically it's kind of joint ownership in that scenario. Because if you get hard money, obviously you can't turn around and issue it on a, um, a first position mm -hmm. lien note unless you're only selling a portion of yeah. them, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I was going to say with when you're buying larger tracts of land as well, there is less competition. Uh, so we're able to get these tracts of land um, at, at sometimes more of a discounted rate. Absolutely. Too. And let's, let's talk about the business model. I, I think you kind of said that earlier. We're, we're buying outside of town, but 15 to 30 minutes away. Um, and so once again, less competition out there. Everyone's going to bid up the cities. Everyone's going to, you know, especially when the real estate market is hot, everyone's going to uh, build those values. Um, but we're buying out, set out a little bit. Uh, just like she said earlier about the criteria of them, uh, you know, still maybe working in town, but they all want their own little piece of heaven out here, you know, in the country. And right. when we go in and purchase a plot of land and subdivide it, we're putting minor developments on there. So it's not just completely raw. So there is some development where we do rows, we do culverts, we do fencing, we have done even electricity, but they're able to then hook up to grid um you said some we've done wells on all of them but a lot of our borrowers want to put their own well as well as their own septic in and so um, whenever we're selling it to the borrower they're already getting um more value to that yeah to that land and, and are they selling them so quickly because they're advertising specifically the seller financing options, more of the yeah. here's your down payment and your payment amount versus here's how much we're selling them for? If I had to ballpark, I'd say 80 to 85% of them are owner financed. 
Got it. Um, very few people will come in but pay cash or, or well, get their I own currency. Some of those people like the 810 credit score you said. I wonder if that person say, well, I'm trying to keep my credit open for XYZ, for something else. Yeah. but I also want to acquire some land. So that's a beautiful way to do that. Because I've mm -hmm. been in that position before where it's like, I've got to re protect my credit for right. something else. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I, and I think their owner financing the land, then they might um, get a loan. It's easier to get a loan for building a home um, as opposed to on the land side. So then they get to owner finance with us. And look, as soon as people are investing their time and money into these places, because a lot of our borrowers, they're putting three generations in on, onto these properties, not all of them, but um, a lot of them are setting roots for their families here. I love that you said that because we've been talking a lot about je setting generational yeah. wealth and how real estate really is one of the only tools that you can predictably mm -hmm. do that. Right. And I would love to have family land or a place where it's like, this is what grandpa did and now it's worth this and we've got our cabins Absolutely. on there or whatnot. That's so right. such a great idea. Yeah, generationally. And again, it's only going to go up. There's only so much. Uh, do you mind sharing with them about the Texaplex? This, you guys, you may already know about this, but it's kind of mind blowing. The growth in Texas. Yeah, no problem. Um, for all you listening, uh, <laughs> check out the Texaplex on on YouTube. I haven't looked at it in probably. 10, 15 years, but there used to be a video called the Texaplex. And the Texaplex is the region between Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, and Houston. There's kind of that, that triangle right there, the golden triangle, if yeah. you will. And this, this video talked about all of the growth and development over the next 10 years that was going to take place because of all of the infrastructure that's already there, because of all of the wealth that's already there, because of all of the diversity that's already there, because of the universities, because of the arts, the hospitals, yeah. uh, I already said universities, I was going to say the schools, uh, there's, and, and, and the economy in general in that area is booming. And I, I told you all, we, we had recently been out of the state for a while and we came back and was kind of frustrated that we didn't hold on to a lot of plots of land that we had because when you go back and look and you go, oh yeah, remember the video, the Texaplex? Yeah, it, it has happened over the last 15 years. The amount of growth and development there. Um, it, it's funny uh, for the, those that are down in the Texas area are familiar, but you know when you drive from Fort Worth down to Austin or something like that, like it used to be, nothing but farmland and now it's just town after town after town and it's just a sprawling uh metropolis kind of and, and i think anywhere you are in the country now you're starting to see that i mean even this just the the wasatch here. front here in here utah it used to be that there was these big open spaces and now you're seeing all of those just fill in so quickly and it's also at the same time that it's filling in it's spreading out, yeah. right? And so there's land that you could have bought 10 years ago, um, pennies on the dollar compared to where it's at right. now. Yeah. yeah, we personally just bought some land where we found out that there was gonna be a subdivision happening uh, behind us. And so we ended up buying some land knowing what was going to be developed on a lake. And uh, you know, even options of just buying and holding um, in those areas that you know at some point are going to. And that, that speaks to all things real estate, right? right. You know, th this is what people have known for hundreds of years now. Uh, they're not making any more land, and, and yet there's a population that's growing. So um, it's just just kind of common sense at, at this point, or at least, you know, in, in our careers and, and what we deal with, that land is appreciating, and it's a, it's a good value proposition right now. Well, and talking about fundamentals, let's talk about some of those fundamentals Absolutely. when you're investing in notes, because people may understand some of the fundamentals if they're investing in single family homes or even multifamily. Uh, one of the things that you guys had already mentioned is you're talking about the municipalities. And so in Arkansas and Texas, uh, Utah is also this way. It's definitely um, very um uh, foreclosure friendly, if you will. Mm -hmm. So there's certain states that you go to and there's these redemption periods and all kinds of things that could happen to where it may take you a long time to 
get the property back if you have to foreclose, let alone then turn around and sell it. And so what are some of the other fundamentals besides, you know, the laws that are regulating that land? What are some of the other fundamentals you guys look for? Well, we going back to the paperwork on the underwriting side, we want to make sure that that's a clean transaction because there's also a market for those that want to sell their notes, say five years in, um, a two years in, it's a seasoned note, but when you have everything on the front end uh, with all of your paperwork clean, then there's a market for selling that note off as well. Um, so uh, that didn't answer your question, but it just made me think of something. No, it is good right. though, because that's something to think about. If you're investing in notes, how long do you actually want to hold them? Because right. again, yeah. you can buy that note for a period of time. This is one of the things that we're looking at as we're looking in these first position lien notes is mm -hmm. with our fund, for example, it's built on the short cycle investing. Mm -hmm. And so right. we're only going to hold for a certain period of time to feel confident that we can give, give the returns to our passive investors. So we would want to be able to turn around and sell that note, hopefully above what we bought it for, mm -hmm. um, so that we still have that spread in there. Yeah, absolutely. There are institutions. So for some of our investors that they only want to keep the note, say two to five years, because that's a big question. They're like, well, I don't want to keep it for 15 years. I don't want to keep it for 10 years. No problem. Like you were saying, I mean, you're going to make so much money on the front end, but then you can turn around as long as your underwriting is clean, then you'll be able to sell and liquidate that note. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, what we do in the, in the underwriting process uh, as far as, so we talked about RMLO, I've already beat up that a fair amount. Um, we also utilize a third party, um, a third party processor that is going to take those payments in from the buyer. They're going to keep track of interest. They're going to issue a 1098 at the end of the year so you can keep everything above board. And then they're going to distribute those funds to the investor. They're also going to escrow for taxes and insurance. So third party processors, great idea to have. Um, we also close at a title company and we not only will the buyer buy title, uh, the, the, uh, borrower by title on, on their property. But when we go through that closing, we will go ahead and, and purchase a lender's policy. So that's another thing to look for if you're dealing in notes is to make sure you're getting that lender's policy that transfers with that note, you know, into perpetuity as many times as it gets transferred. And, and do you typically pass that cost on to the uh, buyer at that point because oftentimes I know if uh, if I'm coming in and I'm buying something and I bring in a, a lender then I am the one who's paying for that policy we keep we pay for that at at the our initial closing and we just give that to you again yeah. when it. we transfer the note it's it's really not that much it's like an extra two or three hundred dollars I want to say okay uh, for the most part probably less on land than um, yeah. Yeah. A typical scenario what about uh, the processing fees how much does that eat of your profit I mean, it's really comes down to the servicing fees as well, third party servicing company, which uh, I, I think it's great. Always buy one that or go through a third party servicing company, in my, my opinion, instead of doing it all yourself. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a mess, but um, they're very minimal for land as well. I mean, well under $100. Got it. Yeah. So as far as added fees, and so when we close, we do multiple ways depending on what our investors prefer. We will close directly in house where our team puts all documents together, or we can close at the attorney's office, attorney's office, whoever they prefer, or at a certain title company. We have title companies that we use, but we want to make sure that our uh, investors are comfortable with that process. And so we'll have different ways of closing. We do uh, work with a lot of people that have self-directed IRAs. And um, there's some in particular that we work really closely with. And so we just do a lot of direct in-house. They know, hey, we know you guys uh, wanna buy another note. So a lot of times with, with an investor, that has been purchasing notes from us, they'll buy a note sometimes before it's even seasoned, before we even get first payment in, 
-hmm. just because they know our process and they've already bought notes from us and they know that we're going to stand by them. Yeah. Um, but we want to make our investors process as smooth as possible. We just, the last two days have been on phone calls with, with two different people and they're going, it's this simple. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is all I have to do. And we're going, yeah, it's this simple, but it's kind of interesting. Sometimes with sharing about notes for someone that may not be as um, in the note space or as note savvy, but may be more familiar on the residential side or even multifamily and commercial, they're, they're just, they understand somewhat of, of what a note is, but it's like someone in Africa sharing with them about snow. Um, what does it feel like? What does it look like? Yeah. You know, um, all those things. Uh, it's cold to the touch. So we so want to touch something and, and experience something. But like Rick was saying, notes aren't sexy, but they're <laughs> really secure. But they're solid. Yeah, yeah, we love them. Again, there's a reason why the bank, um, that's what their assets are. Yeah, I think just... To piggyback on that, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of investors that understand fix and flips. They're very good at that. There's a lot that understand um, wholesaling or that understand um, rentals. And just like you can go touch that building and you know that that's yours and that's what you're dealing with. But with the notes, it's uh, it's paper and you know it's it's a transaction and it creates that that revenue stream. But it's difficult. Because once again, it's difficult because um, there so many people like the idea of of this grand building that they own or or even a multifamily. Uh, love those investors, but uh, I say that there's a an easier an easier way to do it. We speak. We work with so many people that just say, "I will only invest passively." Christian himself started doing fix and flips, and mm -hmm. you're right; it's not sexy. There's no show called "Fix or <laughs> Flip Flip Your Note," you know. But not not flip your uh, note. But there's <laughs> lots of there's lots of flip uh, flip your house. Flip your sure. house or watch that, but it's hard, and it, it might be. It's fun for me to watch on TV, but I don't want to get a sledgehammer, yeah. and I don't want to do right. the demo. Well, and that's the thing is, there's more drama to it, and that's why it's you're able to make these other strategies sexy because you have all of this drama of am I what am I gonna find when I open this wall or what's gonna happen when I you know put a new tenant in here and yeah. um, you know who, who's gonna mess this up or that up and typically in a note it's more, much more standard it's a more passive way yeah. of investing I I wouldn't say it's you know completely passive because you still have to have some of those components in place but yeah. very much more passive than the, the traditional way and I mean I guess this rounds out when you first started this off is how did this come about where we're bringing you now on the show and talking about this. You guys just recently put 40 of your notes onto our listing hub. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we met at that event, it really kind of sparked something inside of me that I had been realizing in talking to many of these passive investors is they want different options. They want, you know, more security at times within their passive investing. Sometimes they want something that doesn't require them to be a, an accredited investor, for example, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of them that they just, they're coming into money right now and it might be 50,000, it might be 100,000. And so they're looking for other ways. And typically what we're dealing with is secondaries in passive real estate and most of that is in within the syndication space and so they're still able to potentially buy in at those smaller amounts but the uh sponsor is going to require them to be an accredited investor mm -hmm. and so that's i guess another fundamental to put out there when you're dealing in notes Huge. it's not a security anymore that you're dealing with you're actually becoming the bank so you're you're right. buying an asset which is uh, a first position lien note, and that's something I guess we haven't mentioned, uh, you know, enough about as well. First position lien is another core fundamental because at that point you're in front of everybody else, right. aside from taxes, right? That's right. Um, you're in front of uh, everything else, and this is why even the banks, if somebody gets too far behind on taxes, they'll pay the taxes. That's right. Just to make sure they protect their position, yeah. um, and so. As we were talking about it, it expedited a thought that I had for our platform is to offer other asset classes within the pre-iShare listing hub. Um, 
so that people could could invest in different ways. And so I'm excited about the partnership there. Uh, we're now creating a an a uh, issuer approval process, very similar to our sponsor approval process, which I believe you guys will probably are be the first ones to go through that, um, which is exciting. And yeah. we love the product that you're bringing out. One of the things that I've done a lot over the years, because I've always been on the creative side of real estate, many different asset classes is, you know, creatively structuring seller financing and owner wraps and subject to transactions. But a lot of those, you don't end up getting to own that first position. You're mm -hmm. usually, you know, yeah. kind of, it, it's a little bit messy. So right. you guys have found a niche that allows you to make a really clean and smooth transaction. Yeah. I like the, so you, you guys put a limited 40, um, of, of those lean notes on our listing hub. And I looked at some of them and I thought, those are so affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel foolish by starting going, why land? And now I'm excited to go look at the listing hub and flip through some of those and see what mm -hmm. you have. Thank well, you for and, making that livable and understandable. Yeah, things. and this is something that from our conversation, there's all these little groups, right, that are in the notes business, and there's people out there that teach about notes, but it's kind of closed off because many of the people that are actually turning the notes uh, are brokering them. So That's they're right. finding the person who has issued a seller finance note, for example, maybe a, a couple that has owned their home for 20 years and it's paid off and they sell it to somebody with seller financing. And then, you know, they're getting to the age where they don't want to hold into that note. So they sell the note to a broker and then that broker is going to turn around and sell it mm -hmm. to somebody else. So uh, I, I don't think there's many good platforms out there for that secondaries market. And we hope to open that up more so this is more of a widely traded asset yeah i, I appreciate that we're excited too uh when we met um and you started sharing about pre i share and this whole process and platform that you guys have it was we just were thinking more and more is like mm -hmm. man notes would be so good on there and and you know just to diversify in something different um with the cash flow first lean position like you're sharing and so we thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to to be part of that because I know it's only gonna gonna grow. Yeah. And we're wanting to put more on there as well. And it was just funny, we had a guy just today, I don't know if it's on the Uber ride here or maybe to the hotel, we were talking to him and he goes, so what does the closing time look like? And we're gonna, we said, well, we could technically close in a week, um, even a little less, just if you're on your end, everything's taken care of, we can close quickly. And he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. No, I don't understand. <laughs> because normally on a closing, it takes, you know, X amount of time. It's like, it's, it's really easy. Again, it's not sexy. Um, very simple and easy. Yeah. So, <laughs> Well, and for others that have found a niche and maybe they're issuing their own seller finance notes, what is the benefit to you selling them? I know like you had mentioned in the beginning, you you never wanted them to pay off because you loved the cash flow. Yeah. Um, I think I know the answer, but I would love to hear it from your perspective. What is the benefit to turn around, turning around and selling those notes? Um, quite honestly, it's recapitalization. Um, we do utilize private funds to purchase the land. Uh, we do have you know some debts that we need to pay, but at the same time, uh, to recapitalize and go do this again and again and again, that's our business model and that's what we're going to stick to to doing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're looking to uh, provide investors with diversification to their to their own personal fund or to their own personal investments um, and give them that solid return and that will help us to go out there and provide more uh, property for those owners that are unbankable out there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think in the next two years, it, I feel like notes are, there's just now a bit of a buzz about notes. And I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see a rise in notes. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And for you guys, again, you want to continue to recapture that capital, go find the next exciting project and continue to mm -hmm. provide that service to people. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and how does it play right now with notes, with the higher interest rates? I mean, in my mind, I feel like you want to you want to buy as much as you can and afford so that when those rates do go down and people look to expand 30 minutes out of town, it's like, boom, you've, you've 
you've already got that investment in place. Some of the savvy investors are looking towards these notes. You're like, how do I make money in a high interest rate environment? Right. Yeah, to, to try to get ahead of it. Because some areas of real estate are slowing down because of, because of the higher interest rates. Well, because of the higher interest rates, we can sell these properties and, and get a solid return and once again, lock it in on a 10 year or 15 or 30 year note. Um, and so that's that's very appealing to lock in those kind of returns for the long term. And I'm sure for you guys, there's less of a spread in between because you're going to have a higher interest rate than probably a typical bank. Right. But as the bank keeps charging more, there's less of a, a gap there. And so it almost makes your product more appealing overall. Mm -hmm. I actually remember my personal house that I uh, live in right now. I bought that one with seller financing. And th at that time, you know, the, the rates were very low. Now we did a wrap on it. He had a mortgage, but you know, the rates were very low and I got a five and a half percent interest rate and everybody kind of thought I was a little crazy to go pay five and a half percent interest when I could go to the bank and, you know, get, you know, three something. Yeah. Right. And now everybody thinks it's genius because right. with, within less than 12 months, you know, rates have gone, you know, 2% or more higher than that. Um, so when it really comes down to it, that, that gap actually works in your favor probably. Mm -hmm. Do you guys increase your rates based off of what the market's doing? I don't think we did. Um, I don't think we did. Uh, there are other seller, you know, those offering seller financing, and I think that they've increased some rates. Uh, I don't think we're, we've been gouging anybody. Uh, the rates that we're charging now, we were charging you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah. I mean, the interesting thing that I'm seeing in the current market is you have uh, this disparity where people do have these low interest rate notes and then they're turning around and they're selling on seller financing at a lower rate, rate than what the banks are, where it used to be, if you're ever selling on seller financing, you're always getting a higher rate. Right. And mm -hmm. now uh, in at least the single family traditional market uh, that I'm seeing, you're seeing a lot of seller financing where they're offering a lower than market rate in order to get their houses sold. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a super mm -hmm. interesting market that we're in. Yeah, it's it's, it's an exciting time too, I feel like. Uh, again, just in the note space and land space as well. Uh, we'll see what happens over these next two years, year. Um, it, there's a lot more people, like you said, I feel like educating on notes and teaching on notes uh, than there was, I mean, even six months ago. So what's the big picture for you guys over the next few years? Where would you like to see this whole thing going? Um, we'd like to scale, uh, quite honestly. Um, we're, we're very confident as a, as a team, as a, as a company that we're on the right track. We're doing some great things. Uh, but any business owner wants to scale and, and grow that a little bit more. Um, right now, uh, if there if there was a bottleneck in our business, it would be finding the right investors for these notes, uh, which is why we, uh, you know, put our our things on our notes onto pre iShare, um, because we're we're looking to once again uh, recapitalize and move on. So if there were a bottleneck in our business, that's what it is. Uh, but if we can get that bottleneck solved through. Uh, your, your website through getting the word out through other investors, uh, getting savvy to notes. And, and if we can begin doing that, then we can scale quite a bit more. Um, we have been discussing a fund. Uh, don't know if we're going to pull the trigger and move forward on that, but we have been discussing a, a fund to, uh, to be a source that can, can purchase uh, these notes. Um, and then it'll give liquidity to investors. It'll give them uh, the opportunity to diversify a portfolio by just buying shares of that fund. I mean, it even it makes it even more simple for your investors. It, it does point. make it even more simple. Uh, absolutely. I would love to see that happen for you guys. Yeah, it, it'd be fun. Well, we mentioned it a little bit in the beginning. You know, I love to hear the purpose behind you know, why people are doing things. And I know you guys are in the space of, you know, helping to uh, create strong marriages and family relationships, but you also uh, help those that have escaped really horrible situations. Do you want to mention anything about kind of that purpose? And is there any um, ways that people can contribute? And I personally want to know, how did that even get started? When somebody does something as interesting as humanitarian work for sex trafficking, it's like, how did you 
yeah. all of his questions and how? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's a good question. So it started because we ended up adopting our daughter and got her the day she was rescued. Um, her and her biological mother were sex trafficked. Mm. And so we got her that day in Houston, Texas, and we were told she may never walk or talk, uh, but she is a thriving 10 year old now and dancing and gymnastics and talks plenty, doesn't meet a stranger. And so she was our driving force. And I remember you one day said, to her and to me, like, not going to stop in that side, like, sorry, getting a little choked up. I am Um, too. So just, I've got tissues if we need. (laughs) Keep talking. Um, It's because of her why we kept doing what we were doing. And so we ended up going to Alaska for a time and building out a place of refuge for women and children that had been sex trafficked. And so we would house them, we would walk life with them, and we did a lot of the rescue. We worked with FBI and local law enforcement as well and did sting operations. And it, But she became our driving force. And so the education piece is something that we're really passionate about and just bringing awareness. We just spoke at our son's middle school recently about it they had asked us and i think just educating kids adults of of what's really happening and you do have to start that young in the education right absolutely um good for you that's a that's our heart and passion really and we both um help caretake on both sides of our family and so we're really passionate about making sure securing that financial income as well for our families and ultimately leaving a legacy. Yeah. I have to say you guys walked in and I looked over and I just instantly smiled. It's it's really cool to see a husband and wife team in business um, because most, uh, my husband and I worked together for a second and we had friends that looked at each other and were like, not a chance or they're mm-hmm. not working with you. Um, but to see that combined purpose and power in the business and what, with what you have going, I really commend you on that energy. Thank you. Yeah. He's my best friend. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. You can make me blush on TV. <laughs> All right. Well, before we before we sign off, I would like to just ask for anybody who maybe isn't totally clear, give us the basics. Give us the kindergarten version. What is a note? How does it operate? How does it transfer? Yeah, of course. Uh, so in general, notes are formed. It's a documentation that's formed anytime there's a loan. So anytime you bought a car, bought a motorcycle, bought a house, there's some documents that you, you signed. Uh, you have a promissory note that has the name, the terms, you know, the interest rate, all of the, once again, the terms of the agreement. You also have a, a deed and a deed of trust. Um, the, the deed of trust is what uh, links your collateral with that, that note. And, and so those in general are referred to as the note. Uh, so anytime, once again, that there's a loan put in place, there is a lender on that. Uh, often the bank, and then there's the borrower, often the buyer of a property. And so when you purchase a note, what you are doing is in essence becoming the lender. When we originated it, we were the originating bank, but you sell it to another investor and they become effectively the bank, the one who holds the documents, the one who holds the paper, and more specifically, the deed of trust that links that promissory note to that um, to that property, once again, whether it's a car or a motorcycle, or in this particular case, land or, or a single family home. Um, and that's what creates that, um, that power position to be in, to, to own the documents to that. And you're literally a lender. You're a lender. And, you, and you're the, transferring at that point, the rights to the, that note, right? That's right. That's correct. It's pretty, pretty easy okay. and simple. Got it. In this case, sexy, non-sexy is pretty sexy. <laughs> there we go. So, I like that. Yep. I love that. Yeah. Thank you guys for having us on and even Absolutely. sharing um, about our our passions too and, and what drives us. I mean, real estate, we all love real estate, um, but also leaving that legacy mm-hmm. um, for 
us is we're excited to have this partnership with with you and encourage people to check out those notes on the listing hub there's going to be more and more and more to choose from as we get going even if you're seeing this later on there will probably be more for you to pick from (laughs) probably be some left yeah thanks for joining us everybody (laughs) thanks everybody passive investors we've unlocked the number one secret to finding performing passive real estate opportunities We want to bring this secret to investors like you. If you're ready to build wealth with real estate like the ultra-rich do, click below to find out more.